In fact, I had a lady who lit up her cigarette in the middle of my interview and I said, you know, as a doctor, I cannot abide this bad behavior. And she said to me, oh yeah? What are you gonna do about it? Hi, I'm Ted Balaker with Reason TV and today I'll be speaking with Dr. Stephen Coles. Coles is an expert in the science of longevity and a lecturer in the Department of Chemistry and Biochemistry at the Institute of Molecular Biology at UCLA. Can you, in a nutshell, tell me about your research? Oh, about 15 years ago, I got interested in understanding human aging. And I said, who are the oldest humans? Because they have done something special. They have escaped from the conventional causes of death, like heart disease, the number one killer, or cancer, or stroke, or diabetes, or even Alzheimer's disease. And it turns out that there are 88 living supercentenarians. So that would be people, people at least 110. At least 110, and sometimes 115 or even 120. In fact, the world's oldest person, when she died in 1997, Jeanne Calmette, a French lady, was 122. So she is our Guinness Book of Records, you know, maximum human lifespan. And the question that everybody, I'm sure, always asks you is, what are these supercentenarians doing right? I found that they were all different, one from another. They had practically nothing in common. They were in different religions and different occupations. But the one sort of common theme was that they had long-lived relatives. So their parents were long-lived, and their siblings, their brothers and sisters, were long-lived. And so I said, you know, it's got to be in the DNA. It's got to be in the genes. They tend not to take vitamins. They do tend to indulge in bad habits. They, they smoke. In an era like when my parents lived, everybody smoked, so that's not unusual. But some of these people smoked heavily. In fact, I had a lady who lit up her cigarette in the middle of my interview, and I said, you know, as a doctor, I cannot abide this bad behavior. And she said to me, oh yeah? What are you gonna do about it? <laughs> <laughs> how, last, old, how old was she at the time? She was 111. They get away with this bad behavior because their genes protect them. But what, what does that say to, uh, to uh, us normal people who, or us average people who don't have super centenarians in our family tree? Are we just tinkering at the margins if we're worrying about, I mean, certainly avoid smoking, wear your seatbelt, get some exercise, but to what extent is that, what's the magnitude there versus just genetics? If you did nothing else but look at your family tree to see what the longevity profile was of your parents, your aunts and uncles and so forth, uh, your grandparents, and if you had no extra advantage in longevity for any of those first degree relatives, then you know, you're OTL, out of luck. Because uh, there's nothing you can do by taking extra vitamins or So eat whatever. all the, just eat that bacon and enjoy it. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, so live a normal life. But that's not the advice I want to leave with uh, people watching this program. The, the proper advice is you should not smoke. You should take your vitamins. You should exercise properly because medicine is changing. You know, you have to be around in order to benefit from the coming singularity. Give a, give a short uh, definition of that. A singularity is when things are accelerating so rapidly, it's not just exponentially rising, but it's almost like going up vertically, so that the rate of new knowledge accumulation will allow Homo sapiens, our species, to be able to make such enormous progress scientifically and technologically that we will be able to solve all of the major problems that are facing society today, including you know, global warming and uh, many of the other questions of war and peace that dominate the news headlines today. So again, they're, they're avoiding cancer, they're avoiding heart disease, but, but uh, explain what, it, what's, what ends up getting them. So I wondered is there something that we could write on death certificates um, uh, besides these conventional causes of death, like heart disease and cancer and stroke? And so we started doing a series of autopsies. 
So far, I have done eight. It, six of the eight, so the majority, have a common disease process that is their cause of death. It's called amyloidosis, and it's a particular type called TTR, in all caps. Turns out that amyloid accumulates in all of us, but very slowly. But when we do an autopsy of a younger person, it's typically found on the certificate of death and the autopsy report. Uh, the ne necropsy says incidental finding. You know, it's a minor thing. It didn't kill the person, but it's in the background. And so I'd like to think of this as the grim reaper waiting in the wings so that if he didn't get you with something else, he still has another way to take a shot at you. And amyloidosis is something that has no cure today. So one of our foundation's major interests is finding out if there would be a targeted therapy against this protein. Is there something like an antibody that would be specific for amyloid protein that would clean out the blood vessels? And then maybe supercentenarians could live even longer than they do now. That would answer a very important scientific and medical question. So everybody will want to know, you know, what, what can I do to, to live a longer life? And I know a lot of it is, is genetics. And we, you mentioned that you yes. should avoid smoking, take your vitamins and so on. Are there, since you're an expert in this field, um, is there anything that is, is, is beyond the obvious, like that people would have overlooked? There are, in my short list, a couple of recommendations. Uh, one is that everybody should do a certain amount of walking. Turns out that exercise is a critical part of maintaining your body function and circulating blood to your brain. People should be taking a multivitamin and fish oil and maybe increase their vitamin D3 level because that's the sunshine vitamin and people don't get enough exposure to sunlight. Yeah, everybody is well, nervous. They're worried about getting skin about cancer. About getting skin cancer, and in the process, the pendulum swung too far. And really, getting sun is important. Uh, and if you're not, and most people are not, then just taking a vitamin D3 supplement uh, at the level of 800 or 1,000 international units per day um, will be very important uh, as a way to contribute to your longevity and uh, reduce the risk uh, and prevent cancer. Are, are there any reforms that we could put in place to speed up the process of innovation? Some people say maybe the FDA is too risk averse. Some people point to patent protections being either too protective or not protective enough. Well, I like the FDA to be risk averse. Uh, you know, one of the things that I credit but the FDA doesn't that keep with, well, yeah, it, it slows the rate of innovation to some extent but it also stops crazy things from happening, um, which take place in the non-pharmaceutical, nutraceutical field, where there is no regulation of companies that are producing uh, products that have a label of ingredients in which when you do product testing, you discover the, the active ingredient is not even in the bottle. But uh, right now, um, the FDA tests for safety and efficacy. What if it yes. just zeroed in on safety and let the market take care of the efficacy part. Might that uh, make things safe and still speed things up? I disagree. I mean, safety is what we call a phase one clinical trial. But there's a phase two trial, which includes a broader collection of subjects to see if the product is safe for children, or is it safe for pregnant women, or things like that, uh, which is not normally tested for in phase one. The German government approved thalidomide as a sleeping pill because it was very safe for the men and women who took it, but nobody was pregnant in that group. Sure. And then it turned out that there were women who took it during like the first or you know, second trimester pregnancy and had babies that were born deformed. But, they, but everybody um, knows about thalidomide babies, yes. and people don't know about the people who could have been helped by drugs that are kept off the market. So does doesn't that well, the FDA knows about you know the, these risks. Ah, let me explain. But they're not on the cover of, of the, the, the FDA has uh, different guidelines for people who are near death because of a lethal disease condition, and 
So they have something called compassionate use of experimental drugs. And so people with you know, very debilitating diseases like cystic fibrosis or uh, uh, other uh, inherited conditions that are doomed to die young could try out some new experimental drugs. So th th there is a safety valve, so to speak, to keep the rate of innovation high. I know a, a topic that, that's brought up on your website quite a bit is immortality. Yes. How likely is that? Well, that's a dream. After the year, I don't know, 2038, when Kurzweil predicts there will be a singularity, maybe we'll readdress that problem. Uh, in the meantime, um, we have to appreciate that there are really very different aspects to immortality. Um, one is uh, you know, death due to getting hit by a truck. I mean, there are many ways to die prematurely. And so I call that extrinsic aging. It's not really an aging process intrinsically in the body. It's something like a lightning bolt that came from above. But the intrinsic aging process is something that we can do something about. So maybe if we figure out how to solve intrinsic aging, then people will become much more conservative and not drive on freeways. Well, we'll uh, live like in maniacs. bubbles that will be bubble people. Well, right? I, I don't know. With the internet, <laughs> I, that doesn't seem to be true. People <laughs> like their social media. Sure, like, but they're just going to yes. be, yeah, like you say, a lot more careful crossing the street, maybe. Yeah, you'll, you'll take a little bit more care uh, in I, uh, what you do in your lifestyle. And, and uh, I wonder what all the Social Security actuaries think about what you're doing. I mean, we're going to have to raise the retirement age to like 99. You know, I think that people should be appreciating that they shouldn't retire at 65 if they're still healthy. They should be contributing to you know, the workforce and to uh, our society by working and not just imagining that they now have the right to travel around the world at somebody else's expense.